Timothy Damastro, it's really nice to have you here. You're you're in Brisbane, right? That's correct. I'm in uh, Brisbane, Australia, right now. Yeah. So I was there, um, I guess, at some point um, earlier in 2013. It's a fantastic place. Yeah, I, I really love uh, I really love the city. It's nice and clean, and it's it's, uh, it's like the the world's biggest town. Really, it doesn't really feel like a a huge city. It's more of like a just a, just a, just a, an enormous town, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. The people are great, and yeah. uh, the atmosphere is great. It's it's just a it's a fantastic place to live. Yeah, I loved even even the public transportation on on the boats was just just a kick, right? You just get on the boat and go down the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I've always thought that Brisbane is the uh, the nicest city in Australia. Um, yeah. Obviously not very internationally long, known, but. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've just, I think, uh, I th- I've been to Sydney, I've lived in Sydney for a while, I've right. lived in other places, right. and, uh, Right. I think I think Brisbane's the uh, the best city. I've not been to I've not been to, to Sydney, but I I spent a long time in, in Melbourne, and no offense to Melbournians, and it's a beautiful place and it's spectacular. I love 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 Melbourne, but if if I had to actually choose between living in Brisbane and Melbourne, I would definitely choose uh, Mel- uh, Brisbane. Yeah, I totally totally agree. With you. <laughs> and Melbournians don't agree, but that's okay. That's yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, anyway, um, the reason I'm having you on is that you're busy making a movie about uh, human freedom, which is really great, and you're at the tail end of a Kickstarter campaign that's fully funded. What was the, what, what, what kind of money were you looking for on your on your campaign? Sure. Okay. So my film is called uh, Freedom from Choice, and it's about um, excessive and usually unnecessary government regulations in the U.S. Um, these regulations could, uh, you know, they, they're seen all around the world, but we focused on the U.S. because that's kind of where um, where they stem, you know, where these regulations stem from, and uh, we could we could show the best examples uh, of these regulations in the U.S. Uh, the Kickstarter uh, campaign is something we launched because uh, before you can release a film, you need what's called errors and emissions insurance. This is before you can release the film to to, uh, to Netflix or Amazon uh, or anyone like that. Um, so we need we needed to raise the funds to do that, as well as uh, pay for licenses, um, you know, um, stock footage licenses and music licenses and things like that. Uh, so we were looking to raise uh, eighteen thousand five hundred dollars, um, and as of today, I think we're up to like twenty thousand or to twenty one thousand or something like that. So. Um, so the, the campaigns worked really well. Uh, we've had a lot of support from libertarians and you know and all kinds of other people. So it's uh, it's been fantastic. Um, I'm sorry. I, I guess I, I feel a little bit silly even asking this, but I should have actually noted when you first started talking that, of course, you don't sound like an Australian at all. <laughs> my my accent's a little muddled. Um, I've lived here for quite a few years now. Uh, my my. Parents are from the U.S. Um, or my dad's from the U.S. My mom is actually Japanese, and uh, we were. I was actually. I lived in Japan for a lot of my life because my dad was stationed there when uh, he was part of the service. Um, but yeah, I have family in the states. You know, I, I I'm I'm often in the states. Uh, I do a lot of work there, but I like to call Australia my home these days. Oh, wonderful! It's just. I'm sorry, I'm just sitting here dreaming of, of, of Brisbane. Uh, can't, can't get it out of my head. When you said that the U.S. is the source, wh- what do you mean by that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I should probably go back on what I said. Um, what I actually meant was that the best examples of excessive regulations can be seen in the U.S. And the film um, points out that although regulations are necessary uh, to protect people from dangers that, that are out in daily life, a lot of these regulations aren't actually put in place to protect us. They're actually there to give uh, specific companies uh, advantage uh, to certain, uh, you know, to certain things. Um, uh, for you know, for example, uh, if you want to look at like regulations in the uh, in, in the food industry, that's something that you know everyone you know everyone needs food. And uh, if you look at it, so if you look at the, the re- those regulations, you'll find that a lot of the uh, regulations that are that are passed are passed to the benefit of bigger companies like Monsanto, and they're passed to the detriment of uh, smaller organic farmers. 
we interviewed Joel Salatin in the film, who's an, an organic farmer, um, who perhaps your audience would be familiar with. Sure. Um, and he lists a whole host of, uh, of issues and, and regulations that prohibit him from doing what he wants to do. Um, and it's all stuff that his, his customers and his clients want, but he's not allowed to do it because of these regulations. Right, and it's a little confusing how this happens. Uh, what did, do you get into this in, in 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 the movie? What exactly is the relationship between large players, large corporate uh, interests, and regulators who seem to be uh, uh, implementing regulations that favor them? Is it does it yeah. is it is does does the political world uh, act as a kind of a third party go between? Absolutely. Uh, we explain this quite well uh, in the film. Um, there's what's called the revolving door, and this is a, uh, a phenomenon in Washington where uh, politicians and regulators will pass laws to benefit certain corporations, and then after they are done with their term, they leave, they pass through the revolving door, and then they become uh, a board member or a chairman or a CEO of one of these companies. So uh, the film lists uh, you know, dozens of examples of this uh, in every industry where, um, I mean, if you look at finance, for example, you'll see that, that, uh, that, that Jack Lou, who was the CEO of Citigroup, is now the, uh, the, the, uh, the head of the Treasury. Or if you look at, um, uh, if you look at um, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of examples like that. Um, so it's a, it's a revolving door that that goes uh, in three directions, right? So you've got you've got people uh, in politics, uh, then they leave politics and go to private industry, and then and then they're tapped to head uh, political appointees to head uh, regulatory agencies. So you've got this kind of uh, this this great triumvirate. That, that's exactly right. Uh, it goes both ways, where sometimes the uh, the individual will start. Uh, at the corporation, uh, weasel his way into a regulatory agency and then go back to a corporation. That can happen. So, you know, they go back and forth. Other times it's just, uh, it's just a, an honest politician that's been corrupted and then he, you know, he, he, he sees that the, the money is greener on, in the private sector. So then he passes laws that benefit uh, the, pe- you know, the, um, the people that, that uh, funded his campaign. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's now working for that company. Or perhaps he's not working for that company directly, but he works for a lobby group or he consults for that company. So really, it's a de facto relationship where he is actually working for that company without actually being on their payroll. Um, uh, the uh, and and each of these individuals, they don't, they're just not representing themselves. They represent you know vast vast interests behind them. Mm. And, and in fact, Absolutely. yeah, that's why they're yeah. there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times, uh, these uh, these acts um, endanger endanger life. Um, a, a good example is in the pharmaceutical industry. If you look at uh, the former um, head of the FDA, it was a gentleman named uh, Lester Crawford. He uh, ha- uh, he he let the drug Vioxx uh, out into the market, and he kept it there, even though there was uh, I think it was like over a hundred thousand heart attacks and. And tens of thousands, and fifty or sixty thousand deaths, uh, and then after he leaves the FDA, he goes and works for a company called Policy Directions Inc. And that company is uh, uh, that company is um, employed by Merck, who distributes bio, uh, who produces Vioxx. So it's that kind of thing that um, you know you have. Uh, I mean, and this, this this is a drug that's killed and endangered so many people, the lives of so many people, and. This uh, you know this FDA commissioner he um, I guess it it was um, it was something that he was happy to let out onto the market and keep onto the market because he knew he was going to get a job working uh, with uh, Merck after he left his position at the FDA. But on the other hand, you have probably plenty of drugs kept off the market because uh, risk averse regulators, uh, insufficient uh, uh, political connections, that sort of thing. Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we interviewed um, Jonathan Emort, who's a constitutional attorney, and he, um, he has defeated the FDA eight times in federal court, which is more than anyone, any other attorney in, in the U.S. Um, and he made the point that uh, the FDA actually doesn't test any of the drugs that it approves. 
So basically what happens is that before a drug gets put onto the market, they, uh, the company submits uh, their test results and basically the FDA just reviews it and then they give it like a stamp, I guess, of approval and then the drug gets let out of the market. Yeah. So, um, you know, according to what he says. So um, this, is, this is the real problem is that the film doesn't um, po point out that regulations are good or bad. It just says that they're kind of, um, it defeats the point of having regulations when the, all that the regulations do is help big business in pushing their agenda. Yeah, and you know, uh, th there seems to be two perspectives on this. One is that there, there's an immaculate conception of the regulatory state and then it's taken over by private interests. Or a, a kind of a different point of view that, that you read in the, in the history of all this stuff, that it's actually industry itself that is more or less behind the creation of the regulatory apparatus. Yeah, I mean, that's very true. I mean, it's, it's gotten to the point where uh, Washington and Wall Street are really the same thing. Um, they're, they're just, it's, I mean, when, you know, it's, it's, it's this kind of thing, you know, when, uh, when a politician uh, talks or if he goes on an overseas visit with someone, who is he actually representing, the people or the company he used to work for? You know, that's the kind of thing. It's, it's so intertwined now that it's just one big money-making operation. And, and basically, the people that suffer are the individuals, you know, the, the public that actually need good policy. The, the, it was probably the most alarming uh, feature of American life that emerged after 2008 uh, with TARP and then all the, uh, all the other legislation that bailed all these companies. It, it seemed like it sort of brought together the, the major power centers of the private sector with uh, the apparatus of, of the state, with the sort of banking financial cartel and it all just began to work, to work as this this unified machinery to f to fleece everybody, and and it's very scary because I mean here we are six years later, uh, it's almost like the, you know the fundamentals of American economic life have, have have been permanently changed. Yeah, I mean it's what happened in two thousand eight just uh, reiterates what the film is about. I mean you had uh, you had Henry Paulson, Paulson who was the uh, chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, uh, the, the previous uh, chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs running the Treasury, and he was able to choose who to bail out and who to fail, uh, who to let fail and all that kind of thing. So it's that kind of, uh, it's that kind of thing where you don't really know why the policies are being, being made. I mean, it's, it's, obvious that the, it's obvious that they're just helping their friends. And we interview uh, Peter Schiff, who's who features in the film, and uh, he makes this point that his his, uh, um, his financial firm and his, his uh, fund, manage, fund management firm has to go through all these types of, uh, you know, all this red tape. And he believes it's there just so that small businesses like his can't, uh, you know, it's like a barrier to entry. They, can, they can't get in yeah. to the market, you know, and it basically just benefits the big guys who have, you know, unlimited money to throw at these, regula uh, these regulatory agencies. And they want the barriers higher and higher and higher. So, which is very interesting because I think I think uh, there's a, there's a tendency to believe that regulations are designed to to um, somehow rein in business, but that's it's not entirely right. It's it's they're designed to rein in some businesses so that others can have a free hand. Well, yeah, that's the problem. I mean, the regulations make the cost of business far more expensive than it should be. And the, the, it's the big business that can pay for these. Yeah. You know, McDonald's can pay for the regulations in the food industry. It's the, it's the local diner down the street that, that can't pay for it. You know, so then they're run out of business and then the new McDonald's opens up. And it's going to get to the point where it's just going to be big, big business and big government uh, you know, running the whole show. In the, in the yeah. Well, uh, you know, thinking about it from the point of view of uh, the sort of the public relations, I mean, what, what you're describing sounds like an obvious scandal, but, but what always happens at these confirmation hearings and otherwise is they say, well, we need experienced people in these regulatory agencies. We don't want just sort of novices with uh, uh, good academic credentials. We want, want people with skin in the game so they can do a, a, good, a good job. Uh, we, want, we want experts that, that know something about the, the sector. Uh, so what do you say to that? Well, I mean, that's, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you want the best and the brightest. So you want the, uh, 
you know, you want the CEO of Citigroup running the Treasury, or you want the CEO of Goldman Sachs running the Treasury. So, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of hard, hard to argue against that because that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's, it's just troubling that after they leave their post in government, they go back to the private sector and they, you know, they make all these friends in Washington, and then they can, you know, they can just uh, they can profit off of that. So, I mean, the only way to really stop this from happening is to reduce the size of government. If the government was small, then this wouldn't really happen, you know, because there would be nothing, you know, there'd be nothing to lobby for, and then, you know, the whole cycle would end. Well, the, the, and this gets us into, I guess, the the area that's that's somewhat controversial because up to now, everything you've said. And I was about to mention this to you. It, it sounds completely um, nonpartisan in, in the sense that uh, people on the left and the right should be able to agree that this is this is a problem and it's, it's a scandal. It's a, cor- a kind of corruption. But what to do about it? Uh, I think is where you get into the the, the political divisions between uh, yeah between yeah. The, the libertarian uh, point of view or the liberty minded point of view. Uh, those who who see the problem as government and and then. And then um, I guess uh, in the U.S. anyway, it's considered to be a left p- perspective that, that the real problem is, is um, the corporate power and that the government needs to actually uh, yeah. expand. So do you, well, I, do you have a perspective well, on that? I, I do. Um, I think that in this particular argument, the libertarians have it correct because I understand, like, th- you're talking about, like, the, uh, the Occupy Wall Street people. Sure. And I agree with them. I mean, they're right. They're angry about... Um, these corporations doing what they're doing, a lot of it's, you know, um, unaccountable uh, to people. But um, the thing is, they can only do it with the help of government. So if you increase government, you're just going to get more of it. So I think the libertarians have this point of view, right? Uh, Most people agree that this, agree in the problem that the merger of uh, big business and big government is, you know, it's way too close. But Making government bigger is not going to be the is not going to be the solution because private enterprise can always buy, uh, the, you know, you, they, you can always buy politicians. So um, and you can also always buy votes if you want to become a politician uh, to benefit uh, a corporation that you're working for beforehand. So um, you really have to um, you really have to reduce the size of government to to get rid of the problem. Yeah, and how do you do that is a, is a, a completely different and, and very complicated question. I guess uh, that's part of the purpose of your movie is to raise public awareness. Yeah, I mean, the, the end of the movie gives a few solutions. Uh, we interview Mike Maloney, who gives a, his view on how to reduce government. We don't focus on that too much. Um, I mean, it's the film has a, a libertarian slant to it, but it's not really a libertarian film. Um, it just, uh, I mean, everyone can relate to the revolving door and and, uh, you know, big business taking over uh, every aspect of our lives. Everyone can agree on that. That's not a libertarian uh, thought. You know, that's just what, uh, that, that, that's just what's happening in, in life. Uh, the, the second half of the movie does uh, give solutions about reducing the size of the government. But, um, you know, those are just, those are just solutions. Uh, those are just uh, suggestions. How many uh, people do you have on your team? Is it just you? Uh, no, I've got a, I've got a, uh, myself, I do most of the, uh, the producing and directing, uh, then I've got a, a camera guy, an editor, and um, a writer as well. Okay. So we've got, we got a small team, but, um, but it's not just myself. What's your, what's I, your... I don't think I could do it myself. Right. What's your schedule for, for release, and what, what, what can we look forward to? Sure. Okay, so uh, the film is called Freedom From Choice. Uh, you mentioned about the Kickstarter campaign that uh, earlier. That should uh, be finished uh, in the next uh, 20 hours or so. Um, so with the funds we raise from that, what we'll do is go and pay for licenses and insurances we need. And then uh, the plan is to uh, premiere the film at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas in oh, July. Oh, good. I'm going to um, be there. I'll see you. Will you be there? Oh, you'll be there? Oh, great. I, I will be there, yes. Oh, great. Let's, uh, let's hang out. And we're going to, absolutely. Um, yeah. And we're going to do a, a question and answer session after the screening. Um, I believe... Um, I have to confirm this with the festival organizers, but I think they've lined up uh, Peter Schiff, Jeff Berwick, and Doug Casey as well, Perfect. Uh, and myself to uh, to host the uh, question and answer panel. So that'll be a lot of fun. That's good. And then uh, once the uh, once that premiere that, that once that premiere is done, then what we'll do is uh, go ahead and release the film 
uh, on DVD and um, on Netflix uh, and through the film's official website, which is uh, freedomfromchoicefilm.com. What does Netflix, how does that work uh, to, your, to your advantage uh, in, in a fiduciary sense? I mean, what sense, uh, is there, do you get royalties for, for appearing on Netflix? Uh, well, yeah, it's not royalties as such. What Netflix does is they buy the film out outright uh, for a certain amount of time. So they'll, they'll, they'll buy the film for two years, uh, regardless of how many views you get. Um, Whereas someone like Hulu pays you per click or per, you know per view, so there's a few different ways you can do it. Uh, my last film um, is on Netflix, so I think that's a pretty good way to go. Well, that's exciting. That's it's fun to watch uh, the new media coming along with these great new business models that that uh, actually make it possible for independent filmmakers like you to to to, to make money, uh, or at least at least pay pay the bills. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I'm looking for a traditional distributor at the moment as well who can uh, try to get the film uh, on, you know, sell it to broadcasters and get it on TV because you still have the traditional media outlets, which is still important. Um, and then I guess myself and my team will focus on all the, the new media, such as, you know, the online, um, you know, selling through Amazon, uh, iTunes, uh, places like that. That's so thrilling. I, I get su such a kick. And, and, and this is for me a real source of hope. Like, what you're describing is uh, this, this, this revolving door and this, this corrupt r relationships and all these terrible things. They seem in some ways to me like remnants of the old world, whereas when you're talking about uh, Hulu and Netflix and new distribution channels and everything, that seems like a new world being born to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it gives power to uh, indep independent filmmakers like myself yeah. to go out and just uh, shoot a film and then... Uh, raise raise money to to, to, to finish the film so and then, beautiful. you know go out and sell it. So um, it so really is an exciting time. For yeah, even Kickstarter yeah. itself is a great a great example of innovation. And that, to me, I mean. Um, I thought about, you know, we were talking earlier about, like, what are we going to do about the problem? Well, one, one way to deal with the problem is, is to innovate, you know, to come up with great things like Kickstarter and, and Netflix. And uh, these are very beautiful because they're kind of outrunning the old, the old apparatus in some ways. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can kickstart anything now. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to see what would have happened if Ron Paul would have run for president at a time when uh, Kickstarter was as big mm -hmm. as it is now. I mean... Instead of uh, money bombs crashing his website, I mean, what if he had to raise, you know, twenty million dollars or thirty million dollars at Kickstarter? I wonder if he would have hit that. I mean, it would have been interesting to see. Uh, do politicians use a Kickstarter? I, I guess I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Well, no, no, I, I don't know the politician that does, but I don't see. I mean, perhaps you're not allowed to on Kickstarter, but there's other um, crowdfunding yeah. uh, sites. I'm sure that allow uh, for people to to get political careers off the ground. I, well, I don't know of any, but I'm sure they're out there. Well, and in any case, uh, you could, uh, independent filmmakers could have used Kickstarter to support uh, his message, so even independent of the campaign itself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. you could have had all kinds of stuff. Um, Amazing. You know, coming uh, to think of it, I don't think uh, Kickstarter allows uh, political camp uh, you know, anything political, but uh, like I said, you know, it would only, you know, you'd probably have someone some entrepreneur build a crowdfunding website just for uh, political campaigns or something like that. Sure, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. The world, world's changing very dramatically. Well, thanks for being part of the change and for hanging out with me today, and I'll, I'll see you at Freedom Fest. Sounds great. I okay. look forward to seeing you then. Thank you, Timothy. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. Bye.